Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to southern and central Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com and by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. State revenue is falling short of projections, prompting Governor Mike Pence to withhold state funds to fill the $140 million gap. If we project out just based on current trends, that number could be greater, could be as high as $300 million. Coming up, the chances those funds will be restored and why some legislators think the cuts are a mistake. Indiana has one of the highest rates in the nation for children diagnosed with ADHD. He'd be crying one minute and laughing the next. he just have these bursts of emotions. The pressures parents and their children are facing and what's causing the state's high rate of diagnosis. And an undefeated IU basketball team. The IU women are 10 and 0, the program's best start since 1994. These stories and a look at this week's headlines right now on Indiana News Desk. Hello, I'm Joe Wren and welcome to Indiana News Desk. State revenues are now more than $140 million below expectations for the first five months of the fiscal year. The shortfall is enough for Indiana Governor Mike Pence to ask state agencies to put a hold on a portion of their budgets. But with $2 billion in cash reserves, some legislators wonder if the governor is overreacting. So I know we can accommodate the news came as a surprise to many state officials, including those at Indiana University, who are being ordered to trim their budget by 2%. That amounts to a $10 million cut. The budget has been set, which is one of the things that makes this, um, this really challenging and, quite frankly, a little bit disappointing because we, you know, we put together a budget um, that included the lowest tuition increase in more than 40 years um, based on you know, the, the, the appropriation that was passed by the legislature. Other state agencies are looking at a 1.5 percent budget cut on top of the 3 percent the state typically has agencies revert at the end of the fiscal year. More than half of the $140 million shortfall came during November. That prompted the governor's cuts. If we project out just based on current trends, that number could be greater, could be as high as $300 million by the time we get to the end of fiscal 14. So rather than waiting till we get further into the fiscal year, when it would be more difficult for agencies and universities to make those cuts with fewer months left, we decided that now was the appropriate time. The governor is also delaying funds for the new Indiana Biosciences Research Institute, which Pence only last week touted as a major accomplishment of his first year in office. He's hoping these steps will save the state $57 million. But with $2 billion in cash reserves, some say cutting higher ed dollars borrows from the future. You see the governor rummaging through the closets at the state house, trying to find things to put in a state yard sale. and. Uh, it, at the micro level, you think, okay, this is just a November, December problem. We came up a little short, but really we need to look at this in the macro spectacle. Gooden says Indiana's economy is consumer driven and cutting budgets will only hurt more. Meanwhile, IU officials are not panicking. Land says they've been through this before. The governor has said that student aid programs won't be affected, so I think this is going to be more of an issue of the university looking for ways to just to run a little bit more efficiently. Land says the best case scenario is the state's revenues come back the next six months and the reserve is released back to the university. In theory, it would be possible for those reserves to be adjusted downward. In practice, that's not likely to happen given the strong um, uh, miss on forecasts that we've seen the first five months. And State House reporter Brandon Smith joins us now. We just heard from the state budget director. And it's interesting because they're asking state agencies to hold on to that money, but it's most likely they're not going to get it back. Now they say hold on to it, but yeah, really, it's it's at the end of each fiscal year, they ask states to revert a certain portion of their budgets. Uh, it's normally about 3%. With this addition, it'll be about 4.5%. So they'll just give that money back come next July. Now there's $2 billion in reserves, so why not use some of that money now and then just adjust the budget 
next session. Well, Brian Bailey, the budget director, told me, and this seems to be the Pence administration's stance, is they really only want to use that $2 billion reserve for a major fiscal crisis, so something like the recession of a few years ago, something like that. Otherwise, they feel like they can uh, s sort of bridge the gap in this short term with just by asking people here and there to cut, as opposed to having to really touch that reserve. Now this move is unprecedented, this has happened before, but on the same token, there seems to be a, a surprise element to this announcement from the governor. Well, yeah, we saw it last with uh, Mitch Daniels in 2010, but that was in the midst of the recession. The state was still hurting, uh, and so he asked uh, everybody to cut quite a bit. This one, some folks are saying it's a little premature that um, we're only five months through the fiscal year. We don't really know what the rest of the fiscal year is going to look like. Things could rebound a little bit. So why cut now when things might not be that bad going forward? Now, Governor Pence just announced several issues that he wants to address in this coming legislative session, but they cost money. A lot of them cost money. So now what? He's not telling us. Uh, we just spoke with the governor, uh, several state house reporters just spoke with the governor today, and he's still staying, saying, uh, saying very little about how he's going to actually pay for a number of these ideas, which include a tax cut, uh, a preschool voucher program. And he says the reason he's not getting into specifics on those issues is that he doesn't want to color the legislative debate. That by saying nothing now, it allows all of the ideas to come out during the, the legislative session, and that way he doesn't, you know, rule anything out essentially. Sure. Well, what now? It's December. What What next? Well, we're going to find out in about a week. Uh, there's going to be a new revenue forecast that happens every April and December. It gives us a, a look ahead to how things might be going in the next few months. Obviously, we've come well short of what April was projecting. We'll see how grim the outlook is for the next few months next week. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Brandon, for coming down here. Thank Appreciate you, Joe. it. Okay. Now, for this week's headlines, we go over to Alex Dierkman for a look at this week's top stories. Hi, Alex. Hi, Joe. Thank you. Indiana is appealing a decision this week by the Federal Emergency Management Agency denying assistance to Howard County. Governor Mike Pence asked FEMA to declare Howard County a major disaster area following last month's tornadoes, making its residents eligible for grants and low-interest loans to help rebuild. The November 17th storms damaged nearly 1,000 homes. 200 were nearly completely destroyed. This is the second time this year Howard County has been denied federal aid. The first was this past spring when it, was, when it experienced record flooding that damaged more than 300 homes. About four times as many Hoosiers signed up for health insurance on the federal exchange last month than in October. That's according to a report the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services released this week. About 700 Hoosiers enrolled in the first month the exchange was online. Another 2,800 enrolled in November, bringing the total to about 3,500. The increase has been attributed to the federal website working more smoothly and the December 23rd deadline for people who will for people to sign up if they want coverage by the first of the year. But advocates admit they still have a long way to go. They're, they're folks that are often working more than one job. Uh, they're folks that, you know, they're, they don't have time to sit around and read the newspaper. They don't have time to sit around and, and listen to radio and a lot of TV uh, news related coverage. So they, they just don't get that kind of information, the information that would really help them. At the current rate, fewer than 7,000 Hoosiers will have enrolled by the end of the year. The low enrollment is prompting the state to extend health coverage for thousands of Hoosiers currently covered under the Healthy Indiana Plan. Up until now, a family of four earning about $47,000 a year was eligible for coverage, but beginning in January, that income threshold will be lowered to roughly $23,000 a year. The 10,000 Hoosiers set to lose coverage were expected to transition to insurance plans through the health care marketplaces, but after much publicized problems with the marketplace website, Indiana has decided to extend its coverage through April. And Governor Mike Pence could meet with federal officials as early as February to discuss using the Healthy Indiana Plan as a way to expand Medicaid in the state. Secretary of Health and Human Services Kathleen Sebelius sent the governor a letter this week agreeing to meet with him, saying, I remain committed to working with Indiana to achieve its goal of expanding Medicaid coverage. Pence has said Indiana will not expand traditional Medicaid. Instead, he's asking the federal government for financial assistance with the Healthy Indiana Plan to expand the state's coverage for low-income Hoosiers. 
Fifteen school districts in the state of Indiana originally filed a lawsuit against the Affordable Care Act, the IRS, and other federal agencies in October. That list grew this week. These 24 school corporations officially joined the lawsuit on Monday, bringing the total to 39. The lawsuit says the Affordable Care Act does not specifically allow the federal government to impose financial penalties in states that opted to use the federal health exchange instead of a state-based one. It also argues that penalties can't be applied to government employers because that would mean the federal government is taxing a state agency, something outlawed in the Constitution. Governor Mike Pence said this week he plans to push for a state-run preschool program targeted at low-income children. But as Josh and Lynn reports, many Democrats hoped the governor would go further. Um, if you don't have numbers, yeah. The leaders of the Indiana Senate's Democratic Caucus announced in September they wanted to create a state-funded universal preschool option. In contrast, Pence proposes to create preschool vouchers for families with incomes of up to 185 percent of the federal poverty level. As we take on that issue, we need to be honest about what the research shows. The results of pre-K education in states that have gone ahead of Indiana in this space are somewhat mixed. The top Republicans in both the Indiana House and Senate have said they would be willing to pass preschool legislation this session. But other lawmakers are concerned about cost and Pence didn't provide a price tag for his proposal. Other education initiatives in the governor's agenda include, include providing a stipend to teachers who apply to and are hired by underperforming public schools and allowing charter school operators to manage multiple schools on a single budget. We'll have more on Pence's education initiatives later in our state impact segment. The overhaul of Indiana's criminal code will lead to more people than the state's prisons. That's the opposite of its intent, which was to reduce the prison population. That's what independent analysis told lawmakers Tuesday. Indiana's criminal code reform bill reduces the penalties for some low-level first-time offenses while toughening the sentences for high-level crimes. But the change will also make it more difficult for prisoners to count good behavior toward their sentence. Analysts at Applied Research Services say if legislators want to reduce the state's prison population, the law needs to push judges to sentence offenders to community corrections and other alternative programs. The federal bailout of General Motors officially ended this week, and five years after that government rescue of GM and Chrysler, Indiana's auto industry has largely recovered. Before the recession, auto manufacturers employed more than 100,000 workers in Indiana. By 2009, more than 30,000 of those jobs were lost. But five years later, supporters of the bailout point out most of those jobs have been recovered. Oppon opponents point out that the federal government took a $10 billion loss after it sold its last shares of GM this week. Nearly a million Hoosiers on food stamps will see a change in the timing of their benefits starting in January. Benefits from the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program are normally dispersed within the first 10 days of each month. A change in the state's policy will now spread out the disbursements of benefits over the entire month. The change is meant to ease the burden on grocery stores. Food stamp recipients will receive at least two mailings and a phone call with information when they can expect to receive their benefits. Joe? All right, thank you very much, Alex. And coming up next on Indiana News Desk. One in 10 children in Indiana are on medication for ADHD and what consequences they could face later in life if they don't get the proper treatment. In our state impact segment, an Evansville neighborhood pleads with state education officials for more time to save their troubled school. Those stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. We believe in the excitement of exploration, that life offers each of us adventures that are ours for the taking. We believe that children are born explorers who need trusted guides on their journeys of discovery. We believe in breaking new ground and in challenging assumptions that important questions deserve to be explored deeply, fairly, and honestly. And we believe that who you are and where you come from should never stand in the way of what you want to be. This is who we are. This is what we believe. This is PBS.
Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. In Indiana, nearly one in 10 children between the ages of four and 17 is on medication for ADHD. That puts Indiana at the fourth highest rate in the nation. Gretchen Frazee reports on what that means for Hoosier children and their parents. As soon as Mark Evans gets home from school, his mom Gloria tells him to get out his school folder so she can check how he did that day. Two Mark isn't having a good week so far. He's lost behavior points for talking to himself during class. So you had points off yesterday too? Uh, and today? Uh, okay. Hmm. Sitting still can be hard for him. Doctors diagnosed Mark with ADHD about three years ago. He did preschool fine, he did kindergarten fine. No, I didn't get any calls from teachers or anything. And first grade was actually okay because he has a brother that is three months apart, so they were together. And then the next year, they, I started getting the phone calls that uh, he wasn't focusing, um, just getting kind of angry, um, not completing tasks. Gloria was reluctant to put Mark on medication because she was afraid of the side effects. But then Mark also started getting in fights with his brothers. It actually got to the point where he was so angry at times that I thought he might burst. I mean, he balled up his little fists, you know, and just get beat red, and he just, he couldn't handle his emotions. But after putting him on medication, her fears were realized. He would just lick his lips until they were black all the way around, um, and then just his eyes would start to look funny. She's now found a medication that works for him. He still gets some facial tics, but not as often. And Mark says it's better than getting in trouble at school. We have this chart called Point Play. And when I don't have my medication, I would, I'd like get a lot of points off. And with my medication, I wouldn't get as many points off. Since 2003, the number of people with ADHD diagnoses has jumped more than 3% nationally. Indiana's rate has increased twice as quickly. Few studies have looked specifically at Indiana, but the Centers for Disease Control names three factors generally associated with states that have a higher percent of its population diagnosed with ADHD. CDC researchers say the more doctors you have, the more likely children will be diagnosed. And the younger the doctors are, the more likely they'll have been taught about ADHD in their training. But Indiana has fewer physicians than other states and has a higher percentage of doctors over 40. Children and families that are on Medicaid often have the highest rate of ADHD diagnosis. About 17 percent of Indiana's population is on Medicaid. That's just slightly higher than the national average. Finally, the CDC indicates states that have high-stakes testing and lower funding for special education tend to have higher rates of ADHD. Indiana has raised the stakes for standardized testing several times since 1999 by linking school funding to performance. And if students don't pass the state standardized test starting in the third grade, they're held back until they do. As far as special education is concerned, the state provides $24 million to schools. To compare, Illinois spends more than $300 million each year. But there are also complicating medical factors. Children that are experiencing conflict or challenges in their home um, and have had higher de degrees of trauma also mimic symptoms of ADHD. Jim Bush works with teachers and school administrators in two dozen schools to try to get them to help students with ADHD. He says while it's important to find out what's causing Indiana's high rate of ADHD, it's also important to make accommodations for the children who are having difficulties in school. When a young person is really doing their best to stay in the classroom, what are their options? Can they, are they able to stand up in the corner and if they're not being distracted? Are they able to do certain things at their desk to help them stay busy? Can they have a squishy ball in their hand to keep them busy? Um, schools are really pushed to hit these targets and these goals and, and fundings related to performance. And so they really need to make sure that the whole class is learning. So if it's disruptive, it becomes challenging. Mark Evans' mother says if his class had fewer students or was better able to respond to his individual needs, Mark would probably still need his medication, but she thinks it would make a world of difference. Especially reading and writing and, as we used to say, arithmetic. If you can't do those three things and focus well enough to get the core, val core of that, then you can't expect that child to go to college. That was my biggest concern. 
that if I don't get him the help he needs right now, I'm hindering him in the future. And while more than 70 percent of children grow out of ADHD, many doctors warn that children who have the disorder and aren't properly treated have a higher mortality rate, are more likely to commit crimes, and have more negative social interactions. Hmm. Jennifer Holleran of the Bloomington College Internship Program joins us for more. Jennifer, we just heard that 70 percent of those with ADHD will grow out of it, but then on the other side, the 30 percent doesn't. So how does that affect them going into, adult her, uh, in, into adulthood in terms of uh, college and employment? Well, it, it can impa impact them in a number of ways. Um, usually someone with a diagnosis of ADHD will struggle with executive functioning issues, so they might have trouble getting up for class. They might have trouble organizing their homework assignments, getting their homework assignments turned into on time. Certainly with employment, they might have difficulty maintaining employment. Uh, difficult with fo difficulty with focus on the job. Mm. Are there certain accommodations that they can ask for help with, let's say, a professor at college or maybe their boss at work? Absolutely, and I would certainly encourage anyone who's entering college to meet at, with the disability services um, wherever they're attending school and ask for accommodations. If you have a diagnosis of ADHD and you have identifiable areas where you need support, there are many things that can help you on campus navigate um, that process, so yes. Um, and at work as well, I mean, asking an employer, and, and sometimes it's really small things that an employer could do to make su you successful on the job. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, a lot of us, when we hear about ADHD, and we think of medications, we think of um, Ritalin or Adderall, but we went online and found that there's actually a lot of medications. What kind of medical help is there? Well, I mean, certainly the expansion of medications offered is a huge plus for anyone who has a diagnosis of ADHD. And in addition to psychiatrists prescribing medications, more uh, pediatricians are aware of the symptoms and more kids who maybe don't have access to a psychiatrist are able to go see their, their pediatrician and get you know, the proper medication that they need. Mm -hmm. We've also seen in some studies that boys have been typically diagnosed earlier. They tend to be a little bit more rambunctious. Maybe mm -hmm. girls can't focus. Um, in as much. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see a big difference between uh, genders in terms of being diagnosed? You certainly can see a big difference. I mean, you know, if certainly those children that are causing more problems in school are going to be quicker to be diagnosed just because of the disruption. So sometimes with girls, maybe if they're not, if their issues are more related to attention they're, or inattention, they might be less likely to be diagnosed. So. And in terms of treatment, do all these costs, do they start adding up after a period of time? Certainly, yes. I mean, the medication can be very expensive, but ad additional treatments, if you were looking at some behavioral approaches, some um, other non-traditional approaches, it can get very costly. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Governor Mike Pence says he'll support expanding the state school voucher program to cover pre-K for some low-income Hoosiers, as we told you earlier in the show. But even advocates say making sure students end up in good preschool programs would be key to that initiative's success. Let's bring in our state impact reporter, Kyle Stokes. Kyle, does the state have any data on pre-K quality right now? Well, they sort of have some data, Joe. There's a system that currently rates the state's pre-K programs, but the rating system has more to do with child care than with early childhood education. Currently, just one in 10 pre-K programs rated under Indiana's system has a gold standard rating. If Pence's idea to offer pre-K vouchers to families earning up to 155% of the federal poverty level, early learning advocates suggest that system would have to be revamped to provide more oversight. It's not just pre-K on which Governor Mike Pence and Indiana's top GOP legislative leaders are coming into line. They all have come out in support of phasing out a property tax on business equipment. The catch is about a third of Indiana's school districts have already seen 10 percent or more of their property tax revenues dry up over the past three years. On Tuesday, Pence said cutting the business personal property tax will help the state remain economically competitive focusing our next stage of tax reform on a plan to responsibly phase out the business personal property tax. And I'm, I'm confident that we can do that in a way that will not disadvantage our local communities or our schools. And I look forward to working with legislators on the details. 
And those details might include allowing individual counties to drop the tax or raising county income taxes to make up for that cut. Now, state education officials could also decide as early as next week whether they'll launch a formal intervention at a troubled Evansville school. More than 200 people gathered in the school's auditorium this week to ask state education officials to give the district time to carry out their own improvement plan for Glenwood Leadership Academy. But the school's already low test scores dropped significantly last year. Neither State Superintendent Glenda Ritz nor State Board members have given any indication of whether they'd like to step in at Glenwood or to take it over altogether. And one last note, Joe, we've been waiting for months for A through F school letter grades. It looks like we'll finally get those next week. So you want to come okay. back for that story. All right, great. Thanks a lot, Kyle. The Indiana women's basketball team won its 10th straight game of the season with an 87-68 win over Milwaukee Wednesday night in Assembly Hall. IU is now 10-0 overall, which is the program's best start since the 94-95 season. Freshman Laren Brooks led the team with 27 points. Her seven three-pointers were a freshman record for IU. Now this comes after a 71-65 win over Virginia Tech in the Big Ten. ACC challenge last week in Assembly Hall. Then Laren Brooks led the Hoosiers with 37 points, setting an IU freshman record for scoring. How about that? Some good news coming from the women's team this year. It certainly is, and it'll be interesting to see how they do in the new year with the Big Ten season. I think they play Iowa in early January. January 2nd, and a, they have a tough schedule, though. Now they go on the road for three games at Cleveland State, Xavier, and IUPUI. Just got to keep it up. That was good long-range shooting. They're, they're the only undefeated team in the Big Ten so far. Something to get excited about on the women's side of the ball. That's great news. Actually, absolutely. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news in southern Indiana throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to southern and central Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.